Some say history is a river that flows endlessly. I say that history is a series of stories written by each person's experiences. Welcome to Stories, a history of Appalachia, one story at a time. Hello, folks, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm Steve Gilley, and this week we're going to go way back, back to pioneer days in Appalachia, and we're going to look at the state that might have been, the state that might have been the 14th state of the United States. The state I'm talking about is the state of Franklin, which was located in what's now East Tennessee, or at that time what was called the Transmontane part, or the -the over-the-mountain part, of North Carolina. During the American Revolution, the government under the Continental Congress had run up quite a bit of debt, uh, as did the states, particularly North Carolina. North Carolina had outlawed the use of pounds or shillings in a patriotic move, and started printing paper dollars. Unfortunately, the North Carolina dollar was not backed by gold or by any other precious metal. So by the time the war was over, the money was uh, practically worthless. Um, I think it was trading at 800 to 1 compared to the North Carolina dollar at the beginning of the revolution. Now, the only asset that North Carolina had was the land that they had over the Appalachian Mountains going over to the uh, Mississippi River. And... What they had decided to do was to cede this land to the federal government. An interesting little side note on this, and this was a bit of a scandal in North Carolina back at this time in the 1780s. At the time, the states were giving warrants or land grants to Revolutionary War soldiers because they couldn't pay them. The only way that they could pay a soldier for his service in the Revolution was to give him some acreage. Warrants went out, they were given, However, a lot of the politicians in the state capital were selling those warrants for land in the West to their cronies and making quite a bit of profit on it. In fact, some of the best land in East Tennessee went to these people. When they ceded the land to the U.S., it was under the provision that those warrants would be honored, including the ones that went to all of their cronies. The land was ceded from what's called the Unaka Mountains to the Mississippi River in April 1784 to Congress. Here's some restrictions they put on that. We talked about that a second ago, so let me elaborate on that. Neither the lands nor the inhabitants should, in the future, be counted in estimating North Carolina's share of the expenses in the Revolution. In other words, if they incurred expenses in Sullivan County or Washington County uh, or Greene County, because of the revolution, it wouldn't count toward North Carolina because they were giving up the land. That the bounties provided for officers and soldiers should be protected. That's where we get back into this whole thing about the warrants. That the territory granted should be considered a common fund for the benefit of the states. That one or more new states should be created out of it. And that if Congress did not accept the sessions, the lands would revert back to the state. While all this was going on, the folks that lived in the present-day East Tennessee, were in a bit of a pickle because North Carolina, by ceding the land, said, we don't have to provide you with soldiers or police or courts or governments. It's all your problem. Well, they took them up on that and set up some conventions to establish the state of Franklin, three conventions, in fact. The first one was held August 23, 1784, with the presiding officer being John Severe, By a vote of 28 to 15, the convention voted to set up a state government. Now, this convention was held in Jonesboro, and it consisted of all the counties in the Trans-Appalachian area except for Davidson County. Uh, The second convention was in November 1784, as they were trying to put together a constitution. That convention didn't go so well. It broke up in disorder, mainly because by that time, North Carolina had repealed the session of the western land of the U.S. and set up the District of Washington as a judicial district and named John Severe as Brigadier General of the Militia for the region, and Mr. Severe at that point was opposed to statehood. The third convention was held December 14, 1784, in order to form a constitution for the state. Now, the first constitution proposed was probably one of the more progressive constitutions ever proposed for a state in the United States. Now, that constitutional proposal 
set a limit on debt imprisonment, universal suffrage. Now, this is 1784, mind you. Universal suffrage, and they decreed that no lawyer, minister, or doctor could hold public office. However, this constitution was defeated. A constitution based on North Carolina and championed by John Sevier was adopted. They chose the name of Franklin after Benjamin Franklin for the name of the state. And elections were set to be held in March 1785. And during those elections, John Sevier, who changed his mind about statehood by this time, was elected governor of the new state. William Cock, for whom Cock County was named, was named as a delegate to the Continental Congress to plead for statehood. Now, Cock appealed to Benjamin Franklin, who told him that he really shouldn't continue in the policy of separation. He wasn't at all in favor of the establishment of the state of Franklin. Interesting side note here, the idea of Franklin actually was proposed in the state of Virginia. Now, in one of our earlier podcasts, we told you about Colonel Arthur Campbell, who was the militia leader during the time of the last raid of Chief Benj. Uh, Well, Colonel Campbell had proposed an Appalachian state, which would encompass what then was Franklin, southwest Virginia, part of southern West Virginia, and eastern Kentucky. The Virginia legislature was so vehemently opposed to that, they passed a law making it high treason subject to execution to attempt to form an independent government within the limits of the state, which at that time included Kentucky and what's now West Virginia. So that kind of ended that. But that gave the impetus to the idea of establishing the state of Franklin. Franklin itself consisted of the counties of Washington, Green, and Sullivan, as well as new counties that were established. The county of Wayne, which is now Johnson County and part of Carter County, Caswell County, which is now Cock County and also part of Sevier County, and Spencer County, which is now Hawkins County and Hancock County. In attempting to establish the state, the state officials sought the cooperation of the Cherokee. This is an interesting little story. There was talk of combining the Cherokee lands with Franklin for a united state consisting of both the Cherokee tribe and the settlers. Would have been an interesting state, however, nothing came of it. In fact, Uh, There were later wars with the Cherokee in attempting to gain new lands to the west. In any event, North Carolina tried to get the settlers to return to North Carolina control. They tried both good and bad things. They threatened them with um, invasion, but they also offered pardons and tax relief. Because keep in mind, during this time, if you owned land within the state of Franklin, who would you pay your land taxes to? Would it be Greenville, the capital of Franklin? Or would it be to North Carolina? Nobody really knew. So if you didn't pay your taxes to Franklin, they'd seize your land. If you didn't pay your taxes to North Carolina, they could seize your land. Sevier was conciliatory to North Carolina. The legislature, however, was not. They raised a militia to fight North Carolina and set up a land office. As a result of all this, North Carolina said, well, you know what, we're going to go ahead and set up courts, sheriffs, militia, county governments. We're not going to recognize these new counties that Franklin established. We're going to say there's really still only three, Washington, Sullivan, and Green. But they set up a parallel system of government within the state of Franklin, and they named Colonel John Tipton to represent them in Franklin. Now, speaking of John Tipton, we had some conflict between Mr. Tipton and Mr. Severe. In August 1787, Tipton and his 50 men under the guidance of North Carolina, attempted to seize the Franklin court records in Jonesboro. However, he was opposed by 200 Franklinites, so that never did come to fruition. However, Tipton wasn't done. In February 1788, Tipton ordered the North Carolina Washington County Sheriff, a man by the name of Jonathan Pugh, to seize severe property to settle taxes owed to North Carolina. Remember, we talked about those land taxes, okay? Severe obviously wasn't paying to North Carolina. He was paying to Franklin. So Tipton used that as an excuse to go and seize some slaves, which was the main property that he had. Tipton got the slaves, took them back to his home, which is now the Tipton Haynes site, and put them in an underground kitchen under his control. Severe didn't like that. He gathered up 100 men, took off to Tipton's home to get his property back. 
Tipton called in Colonel George Maxwell of North Carolina, who arrived to reinforce him with 100 men in a heavy snowstorm in January. There was fighting going on. Severe retreated to Jonesboro. Three men were killed in this battle, many wounded on both sides. And by this point, things were starting to fall apart. In March 1788, Indians started attacking Franklin's settlements. Uh, Severe, needing money for the state, sought a loan from the Spanish government with the help of what came to be known as a paid agent of Spain, Dr. James White. Because of this, North Carolina arrested Severe on treason charges in August 1788, took him back to Morganton, North Carolina, but his supporters followed him over there and released him with the sheriff taking no action and got him back over to Franklin. By this time, Franklin was actually collapsing. Severe and his supporters went to what's known as Lesser Franklin, which is the area between the French Broad River and the Unaka Mountains, which is now Cock County and Sevier County. In February 1789, knowing things were done, Sevier swore an oath of allegiance to North Carolina. Franklin officially ended, except for some holdouts in Lesser Franklin, who were concerned that they would lose title to their land because where they were at was considered Cherokee Indian territory and not available for settlement. North Carolina then uh, ceded all the western lands to the U.S. and the United States formed the Southwest Territory. These settlers down there in Lesser Franklin set up their own government under Articles of Association similar to the Watauga Compact. Uh, This was adopted in Newell Station, which was made the capital of this state, They held out for another two years. It finally ended in 1791 when Governor William Blunt of the Southwest Territory made the Treaty of the Holston with Indians at what's now known as Knoxville. The Indians ceded their lands in that area of Lesser Franklin to the U.S. and so they could get all that taken care of and be able to keep their land. Sevier was elected to Congress in 1790 from the territory and Tennessee was admitted to the Union in 1796 with, yes, that's right, John Sevier as the first governor. And John Tipton, in fact, signed the Tennessee Constitution as the representative from Washington County. So there you go, the story of Franklin, the state that might have been the 14th state of the United States. Well, we hope you've enjoyed the podcast, and if you'd like to subscribe, you can do so by going to iTunes or to Stitcher, or you can subscribe at your favorite Android or Windows podcast app. We're also on Facebook. Be sure to come to Facebook and like us. And we're also on Twitter at Story Appalachia. So until next week, you all have a good one. We'll catch you then. So long, everybody.